Last Sunday, we talked about uh, the Foursquare Church. What is the Foursquare Church? Oh, yes, middle schoolers. That's your, that's your cue. When you see Vanessa get up and walk out, she's not leaving because of the message, but because... Or maybe she is. I don't know. No. Last week, we talked about the Foursquare Church. What, what are we all about? And just to give a background and information about who we are. And hopefully we did an okay job. If I was to say, what are the four, four distinctives of the Foursquare Church? You would say, you would look up on the wall and you'd say, well, it's all about Jesus Christ. The ministry of Jesus Christ as our Savior, as our healer, as our baptizer with the Holy Spirit, and as our soon coming King. That's basically the, the undergirding tenets of the Foursquare Church. We're all about Jesus Christ and his ministry historically his ministry in the present, and his ministry in the future. And so we live in, in, in this block of time that each of us is blessed to be able to live in. But we can look back on a history through biblical resources and, and church history and see what God's been doing in the past, see what he's doing now, and be absolutely assured that he's coming back in the future. Today, I would like to show a video. I've only done this once before. And the video is of uh, a guest speaker that was uh, a great friend of this congregation. His name's Jerry Cook. Jerry has been with us over a dozen times over the last 18 years. Jerry is, uh, he was one of my dearest friends. Uh, spoke deeply into my heart and life. Shaped me and much of the way that I think about walking with Jesus and pastoring God's people. Uh, he has a strong voice to the Foursquare Church and to the body of Christ. If you haven't written his, uh, probably his most read book, Love, Acceptance, and Forgiveness, I would encourage you to do that. You can get it online or however you can get it. It's, it's available. He communicated the heart of God like, like no other man in a uniqueness and a giftedness and a down-to-earthness. In fact, you probably, hopefully you remember the last time he was here in 2013 when he taught us about Psalm 23. When Jerry talked, when he taught the word, it was like, it was familiar, but it was the uniqueness of Jerry's ministry. Well, it was, it was in 2013, January 11th, uh, no, 14, January 11th, he passed into uh, the presence of Jesus. In May of 2013, Jerry was asked to bring a message to the Foursquare Convention. Every year we gather somewhere around the United States. This year we're going to uh, Anaheim. Anaheim is known for what? Good convention? Disneyland. Disneyland. Oh, yeah. So we're gathering in Disneyland at the end of this month. But th this, this particular, in 2013, it was in Florida. And Jerry was asked to bring a message about the distinctives of the Foursquare Church. Uh, being a uh, pillar of faith, being a man who had lived and ministered for over 50 years in the church, would bring a, a unique uh, insight into that. And I can remember when he was here earlier that year, um, it was kind of a funny story that the day that he was to leave <clears throat> after preaching about Psalm 23, we headed for the airport and we wanted to get there in plenty of time. So we got there early and it was a couple hours before his plane was to leave. So I said, you want to get a bite to eat? He said, sure. So we sat down in the restaurant at the airport and we were talking and we were talking. Pretty soon I looked at my watch and I said, oh, Jerry, your plane leaves in five minutes. <laughs> and he, there's something about Jerry, you just could not rattle that man. He said, oh, well, let's check. So we started walking towards his gate, and they were saying, this is Alaska Airlines, paging passenger Jerry Cook. Your flight is about to leave. Please get to the gate immediately. And so, yeah, I could only go up to security and then saw him walking down just at a casual pace. Jerry didn't run. So I said, I better wait. So I waited. And about 10 minutes later, he came walking back. <laughs> He says, they locked the gate. The plane was still there, but they'd shut the gate. And I said, well, I'm sorry. It's my fault. And he said, well, we were having such a great conversation. Um, I said, well, come on back to Carson. We, we arranged to have his new flight 
uh, the next day. And so I said, give us more time to, to chat. <laughs> so we came back and he stayed overnight at the house and we were, I don't know how late we were up to that night. And the next morning we left for the airport with plenty of time <laughs> and actually went to Reno through Virginia City. He'd never been to Virginia City, so we walked around Virginia City and just had a wonderful time. Um, very sad at his passing. He had a, quite a battle of cancer with colon, colon cancer and uh, continues to impact uh, people. And uh, I pray that as we listen to Jerry address the ministerium of the Foursquare Church, two or 3,000 people, we were gathered there for this. You'll, if, you, if you're not familiar with Jerry, you'll recognize his, uh, his humor, but the pointedness with which he ministers. And so this is part two of, of what is the Foursquare Church. And this is from Jerry's perspective about um, what is the uniqueness that's given to the Foursquare Church as part of the body of Christ. And I hope that this will help enrich you and not only intellectually, but also uh, feeling the heartbeat of, of Jerry. So I get to sit down and, and watch this morning and, and hope you will enjoy this time with Jerry Cook. Ready? Let's go. Well, does anyone know who I am? <laughs> I'm looking over here because, because uh, Joseph threatened to uh, introduce me. And he left me. <laughs> All men have forsaken me. <laughs> okay, Glenn. Glenn, you, you, um, you made me very uncomfortable. Um, I was told I could wear no tie, but I had to wear a sport coat and no jeans. No denims was the exact word. On my island, dressing up is tucking in your shirt tail. We don't know there are anything but denim. But I got these pillowcases out of my closet, and I wore them tonight. And then I saw you. And I thought, I have been led astray by the most magnificent man I could have possibly been led astray by. I do not thank you. <laughs> Am I just supposed to do my own introduction? What's the deal? Everybody gets a big introduction. What? It's already been there? I didn't see it. Was it good? Well, why didn't you clap? No, that's too late now. No, 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 no. It's, it, it's, it's too late now. Too late. Just, just, just stuff it. Well, what, oh, what a night. I'm, I'm somewhere between exhilarated and exhausted. I just think this has been marvelous, don't you? The, the worship has been outstanding, the, the, the young man that spoke to us, my Lord, how many home runs can you hit in 10 minutes? <laughs> it was just magnificent. And, 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 uh, and, and I, I'm here to, to, to give us some shallowness and some, some, some relaxedness and, and get us back down to the planet a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. I, I would like to do two things before you know we pull up and, and have our talk, but I, I, I'd like to do a couple of things. The first is to take out my handkerchief to wipe my nose, <laughs> put it behind my Bible so it will look obvious to me. 
The, the, the first is that, that I'd like to establish an order uh, for this meeting in terms of the verbal and, and prophetic gifts of the Spirit. We always in every gathering, uh, be, because of our belief in the imminent presence of Jesus, we always give place for him to speak prophetically as he did uh, with, with our brother just a moment ago. What, what a powerful, I mean, incredible. And, and uh, so, but I believe that sometimes we, we, we don't provide a vehicle for that. And so consequently, the, the gifts do not, do not have a means to express themselves. And so, I, and, and in your home church, of course, you, you would have that order in place so that those that attend regularly would understand how that, how that happens. And it would be done uh, in, a, in an orderly way. But in a gathering like this, where, where basically it's a one-time deal, uh, we need to, to, to establish that order. And, and I believe God has uh, an order that he intends for his spirit to, to uh, be available to us should he desire uh, to, to speak to us prophetically. What, what the order tonight will be that there are two men that, that uh, have, been, uh, have been chosen. There are men that you know, uh, Bert Smith, uh, uh, Sam Rockwell. There, there are two men that, that you know that have stature amongst us. And, and they are available for the expression of those gifts. Uh, they're not available for you to go and tell them what you, what, what you have. They are the ones through whom any further prophetic utterances would, would, would come. And, and uh, I, I can't see either one of them because the lights are wrong. I, there, there is nobody in front of the, the ninth row Everybody is back against the wall, so I, I, you know, God Himself is going to have to show up and show them where, where show me where they are. But that's the way it's going to happen. <laughs> are you okay with that? Okay. If you're not, well, then tough. Uh, the the other thing that that I would I would like to mention is that I I consider. Uh, the, the preaching of the word, and I graciously call what this thing I'm doing that, uh, I, 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 I understand that to be a type, a form of prophecy. And so for that reason, uh, it, 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 it'll not be interrupted, but also for that reason, uh, we can expect uh, the, the power of, of the Holy Spirit to be present prophetically so, so that we don't have to have a great climax at the end to which I have led you, but all through the next few minutes as we talk about the various items that we're going to talk about, all through that time, um, the Holy Spirit is, is alive and working amongst us. And if you're here, and there are areas of, of, of unwholeness for you, places where you've been bruised, where you've been wounded, where any of that kind of stuff. I believe that in the preaching of the word, the Holy Spirit will touch that point in, in, in your lives. And when he does, when that comes to your memory, that's not just so you can hurt again, that's so you can be healed there. Do, do you follow? And, and, and give yourself to that. Allow that healing to take place. If you're physically unwell tonight and you're suffering, that, if that comes to your mind, if that comes to your attention, that's not just you physically complaining. That may well be the Holy Spirit alerting you to now I would like to heal you. So, so be sensitive to those kinds of things. Do you follow? If there are areas that you've been confused about and you've needed uh, some knowledge or, or some wisdom with regards to that uh, during the speaking, whether it's on the subject or not, is quite irrelevant. It's the occasion that he takes advantage of. And he will perhaps during that time bring 
insight to you and understanding to you and awareness to you that you may not even thought of before. Don't take that as just kind of a random thought that shuffled through your mind. Understand that to be something of the Holy Spirit for you. Can, are we okay with that? Do you see what I'm saying? Okay, so be alert. Okay, draw your chairs up. Let's have a talk. I'm glad you could drop by tonight. I, I have for all of my life, all 125 years of it, <laughs> I, I have beat, oh, I don't like that. I have strummed, I don't like that either, but I have emphasized the, the, the fact of the body of Christ as the presence of Jesus in the world. I, I, I'd like to read a, a passage of scripture. I've chosen not to put anything in PowerPoint. Uh, I, I just thought it'd be kind of fun to make you listen to me. <laughs> and to realize it really is in the Bible and it's not just on a screen someplace. And if you have your Bible, that's what we used to say, you know, if you've brought your Bible with you, and most people have, if you've brought your iPhone or your <laughs> iPad or, or your Air, whatever it is that you read now, I want to read quite a, a, a lengthy passage of Scripture in Ephesians, the first chapter. And I, I, I want to interrupt one of Paul's thoughts, because if you don't, you'll have to read the whole book. But I want to interrupt one of his thoughts at verse 18, and I, and I want to read down through. Now, I, I, I'd like to have you hear me, even if you have something there that you're following me along. I would prefer that you not see what I'm saying. I would prefer that you hear what I'm saying for this period of time. Are we okay with that? I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. Who of us hasn't preached a good three-point sermon on that? It's, it's incredible. That power is like the working of his mighty strength. This great power for us who believe is like the working of his mighty power which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms far above all rule and authority, power and dominion in every title. Let me, let me move away from that. And in my Bible, just across the page, it says in, in, in a corollary passage that not only has Christ been raised and seated, but God has raised us up with Christ. Wow. And seated us with him in the heavenly realms, in Christ. So everything else that I am reading, that is, is in us that we are talking about, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every title that can be given, this, this, this heavenly realms, that's, that's over all dimensions, that in all dimensions, and we are told now by quantum physics that they are unlimited. I don't know what that means. But it's impressive that he's above all of that. He's over all of that. He's far above all rule, authority, power, and dominion. That has to do with world authorities. That has to do with world structures. That has to do with social structures, that has to do with political structures, it has to do with the power structures of a fallen world. He has authority over all these fallen power structures. Far above rule, authority, power, dominion, not only in the present age, my goodness, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything. 
Wow. For the church. Get it? Which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Oh my goodness, what if that's true? <laughs> do, you, do you see what I'm saying? What if that's not just a religious writ? And we all know that, we know that it's true. But does it change anything for your every day? Now, I do not believe that any single body of people, however they construct themselves, is meant to be the entire expression of everything that Jesus is in every way. The Scripture teaches us that, that individually we are members of one body, but that individual simile is also a principle that says there is a body in the world that in its fullness is the exact presence of Jesus in the world. And that there are parts of that body that have specific purpose and intention. Uh, Tammy and, and, and we were together and she has some uh, background in, in medical things and she was describing to me the, 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 the finger and the complexity of it and how, how it, it has all of these varying pieces and parts and ligaments and, and, and all those names that she used that I don't know what she was talking about, but it's all, it's all in, in, in the finger, which is part of a hand, which is part of the, the body. You get it? I would like to suggest to you that the reason that I'm four square and began my ministry there 47 years ago and have continued within the context of that expression is, is because that is the expression of Christ's person that I was asked by him to illustrate, to express, to be. A diamond, it's made up of, of, of so many facets. And, and some of the facets are small, some are large, and, but they all catch the light a little differently. And they catch a color that is quite unique and when added to the whole is, 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 is the brilliance of that diamond. And you see where I'm going with this. I believe that, that our family, tribe, whatever you call us, us, this thing that we are, I, I don't think that, that we're just supposed to be a conglomeration of a whole lot of stuff that happened to find each other. I think we are intended to be a specific facet of the presence of Jesus in this current world that we are a part of right now. And I believe that has been true for every month of every year of my life for the last 47 years in terms of my own placement in ministry as well.
And, and, and as I was thinking about all of this, I, folks, listen to me. I, you know, I'm an old man, and I, I, I'm out of here. I'm not the future of this church. And the people in my generation and one generation behind me, you're not the future of this church either. And you might as well wake up and realize it and start fathering the ones that are going to be the future of this church. But I'm so tired of hearing, what is our identity? Oh, Lord. If I'm asked that question again, I'm going to... You wouldn't want me to do it in public. <laughs> What's our mission? Oh, for the love of Pete. Get out of bed. That's a good start. What do you have to know? What has God called you to do? Well, get up and do it. Your identity comes as you minister. It doesn't come as you sit on the curb wondering who in the name of heaven you are. Thank you for all seven of you that clap. No, that's wonderful. What is this all about anyway? Are we stumbling around with blindfolds on, hoping somebody will show us the way? Well, if you are, stop it. I love that Bob Newhart clip. That's my theory of counseling. <laughs> Stop it. That would save us so much time. <laughs> we have been given four specific facets of the person of Jesus Christ and we have been given the stewardship of those four things in terms of representing and being that presence of Jesus in our world. Yes. Now, this is not rocket science. And I heard somebody just recently say, we need to get over Amy. Excuse me, I think that's part of our problem. We've tried to. And I don't mean we ought to go back to white robes and so my mother, my, my mother wore a, a, a uniform. She had a white dress and a blue dress and a shield. She wore it every Sunday. I couldn't figure out why, but, but. I'm not suggesting we go back to that for heaven's sake. But we have a heritage that illustrates for us in a slice of time what this facet of Jesus looks like in a contemporary setting. It looks like throngs of people finding the redemption of Jesus Christ. It looks like throngs of people being healed, being filled with the Holy Spirit and expecting Jesus to come momentarily. What's hard about that? What, what's unsavory about that? What about that don't we like? It seems to me, and I'm disgusted. I don't know who this old man they have on the screen down there is, but he's been there the whole time. And I'm getting tired of looking at him. Thank you, they just turned me off. <laughs> oh, why didn't you do it sooner? When I say Jesus, the Savior, I'm not talking about a model. I'm not talking about a sermon topic. I'm talking about a presence, that there is a body of people whose presence is, in fact, the saving 
presence of Jesus Christ in their world. I don't mean they're talking about it, preaching about it, reading about it, studying about it. I mean, these are people who understand that where they go and what they do, whatever that may be, they are in fact the presence of the saving Jesus, the Jesus that brings wholeness to every situation. We, 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 we encounter, I, I'm going to say hundreds, I don't know, it seems like that, doesn't it, of, of, of situations that are so unwhole, that are so desperate, that are so painful. D don't you wish that Jesus would come and be there? Well, hello. He's there. You don't have to pray that he'll come. Oh, Jesus, come. Where in the world is he coming from? What if he doesn't want to come? Where does he go when we leave? Where you are, he is. Now that's important. You're the point where miraculous wholeness can happen like that. And you may not even be aware of it. You don't have to get accolades. You don't have to give a message in tongues and interpretation and knock the poor checker at the Safeway down and jump up on the counter and just be there. Because you're there, it's more whole than it was before you got there. And if there's a specific assignment for you in the being of that wholeness, trust me, you won't be able to get out of it. You don't have to go looking, oh, I wonder what I should do. Maybe I should speak to that person. Oh, a strange Holy Spirit, give me some kind of a vision. Show me who it is. Oh, for the love of Pete, cut it out. We aren't called to be spooky. We're called to be the presence of Jesus. Jesus wasn't spooky, but he was present. And it's this wholeness that drives us. It's this, this, this presence of wholeness that answers to the incredible need for social justice. It's this awareness of presence that answers to the absolute, there is no choice about multiculturalism. If you have a problem with that, well, you're in the wrong bunch. Because we don't have a problem with that. We welcome them. All colors. All, all combinations of colors. It's this, 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 this message of wholeness, this presence of wholeness that drives us to not incapacitate any member of the body of Christ. And I am talking about both men and women. And if you have a problem with women in ministry, then what in the name of the heaven are you doing here? Listen to me, I'm an old man, I can talk like this. Jesus as Savior. That, that doesn't mean you line people up and, and heal them, it may. And if you're directed to do that, for goodness sake, do it wherever. But it means you are the healing presence of Jesus. Where you are, health exists. <laughs> do you understand me? That people are healthier just because you're there. That pain stops just because you walk up? Well, that doesn't mean everybody knows why their pain stopped. You don't know either. Trust me, the presence of Jesus brings healing. 
because we understand something about God. I'm talking loud, aren't I? Do you suppose I'm excited? It feels kind of strange. I am excited, and I've got to hurry, too. I just, that thing just keeps ticking. Just take it away and put me back up there. <laughs> they did, at least one side. They still got the ticking over here. Yeah, keep it going. I'll carry on forever if you don't. Jesus as healer means that we acknowledge the fact that God is always, always on the side of health and healing. Always, always. There will never be a time when he is even slightly on the side of suffering. Never, never. Why did God cause this? He didn't. Why doesn't God do something about it? He did. Well, Jerry, you wouldn't talk like that if you had a problem of your own. And I, pardon me, but I'm going to say something here. That statement doesn't come from an ivory tower idea. I live with that statement every minute of every day. Six years ago, I was diagnosed with colon cancer. I went through a year and a half of chemo and radiation. They gave me all the radiation I could have, and I still glow in the dark at night. <laughs> Five years later to the day, that cancer returned. And for the last year, I've been back in chemo. Well, I was in the hospital the first time around. Some guy, I don't even know who this guy was for Pete's sake. He came up and said, oh, Brother Cook. And right then I knew he was the enemy. <laughs> oh, Brother Cook, why did God allow? And I said, just be quiet. I was, I was having a perfectly good morphine trip before he came. <laughs> And he interrupted it. And I didn't even know him. Oh, why did God? I said, go away. Oh, brother, go away. Well, I don't have time to recover from you. God and I are doing fine. If my cancer gives you a problem with God, then you and God go somewhere and solve it. Don't bring it to me. God is on my side. That's why I'm in chemo. Because he's on the side of wellness. He comes with me. He touches me in every loving touch. And in all these years, not one technician, not one doctor, not one nurse has ever touched me with roughness, with coarseness, with a lack of caring. They have touched me with love and with care, and often they have touched me in Jesus' name. He is with me. Whether I have chemo for the rest of my life, I don't have a clue. Nor frankly do I care a whole lot. Oh, wouldn't you like, well, of course, we'd all like to not have the pain wherever it is. You're all hurt in some place, for heaven's sake. You'll all die of something. It's the only way off the planet. <laughs> Give it up. Understand we are the healing presence of a God who is always on the side of wholeness. Jesus never touched one well person and made him sick. Jesus never took one living person and killed them to teach their relatives a lesson. He's the God of the living and the God of life and the God of health. Our presence must state that. If I had time, let me tell you what I'd say.
What kind of a cop out is that? It's a good one. We are people who personify, who are the very presence of a Jesus who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? That means that we are a people and a presence that believes in the imminent presence of Jesus. He is at hand here and now. That's part of it. The second part of it, we believe that through the Holy Spirit, Every gift of the Spirit is resident within us, and whatever He would like to call forth at whatever time, in any situation, for any purpose, we are perfectly and fully equipped to get that call. Enough of this, what's my gift? For heaven's sake, if you have to test yourself for a gift, it's probably not much of a gift. I'll wipe my nose on that one. (laughs) Well, what about speaking in tongues? Well, for heaven's sake, do it and get on. (laughs) Is it initial? Is it right? I don't care. The shoes have tongues in them. Buy the shoes. (laughs) Don't buy the shoes and then try to cut out the tongues for the love of Pete. Either buy them or don't buy them. Well, it's just embarrassing. Well, then be embarrassed for heaven's sake. What's the problem with that? Foolish, more foolish things than that. You do and are not even slightly embarrassed. It's not embarrassing. It's a language that God has invented for you. Okay? If you don't want it, then forget about it. But we are a presence of a spirit-filled people who have all of the gifts resident in us, and that includes the ability to be linguistically touched and led and directed by the Holy Spirit. What's so unusual about that? He invented language for heaven's sake. Without God, there would be no language of expression but I don't have time to go there. But you see how good it would be if I did that? (laughs) Get on with it. Be the immediate presence of Jesus. Be filled with the Spirit and understand that all of His intentions and purposes that will meet every situation are resident with you. That's why you're on site. And finally, soon coming king. I don't know about premillennial, postmillennial. I'm kind of pan-millennial. I think it'll all pan out. I don't know much about mid-trib pre-trib, post-trib, I don't know, I, I don't know. I'm just telling you, I don't know. You want to know something else? Neither do you. <laughs> and I'm okay with that. I'm especially okay with not, of, of you not knowing. <laughs> I believe Jesus could come before I finish this sentence. He didn't. but he will interrupt some sentence someday. Songwriters, give us some songs about the second coming of Jesus. You're writing about everything else. Where are your songs about the second coming of Jesus? Let's have some. I need to sing about it. I need to understand it, and I need to be a presence that brings that hope to a world that is utterly fatalistic 
and hopeless. This is not the end. Not, uh, we won't go there. This is not some weird seance thing, honestly. But it's the miracle of, of uh, video. You can sense the very spirit, the clarity with which he spoke. And he does continue to impact lives. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you for, for Jerry, for the gift of his life and how it has touched us. And how you desire for it to continue, your Holy Spirit, to be ministered through us. And the truths that Jerry shared, that we, we are a unique family, part of the, the wonderful, beautiful body of Christ. Help us live unabashedly, unashamedly, in the understanding and the giftings and the mission that you have given to us. That we would be people who live the reality that Jesus is alive and that through our lives there can come the presence of Jesus in our world. That we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen? Amen. Let's walk in that. God bless you. You are dismissed. Have a wonderful